Hi, um, tonight I got a question asking, could I please explain 2 Peter 2, 19 through 22? And I will admit that that is one of the scariest passages in the Bible. And um, if you know anything about my background and you've seen my videos, I say that my previous method of interpreting the Bible was to find the most staggering accusation of the worst thing you could be and do in the Bible and then apply it to myself and see if it fit and then just go through all manner of fear and terror as I did this. I was morbidly attracted to this stuff for years the same way people are attracted to porn or to horror movies, you know, so and I something about uh, scaring myself to death I think gave me some weird kind of well my identity because of my background was one of shame so shame fit me the best and so when I wore that those shame verses I felt like myself you know I didn't know how to fit any other character so that was the one I was good at feeling like even though it was absolutely miserable well now, as a grace person, I say my method of interpretation is I'm always looking for a way out. Always, always looking for, okay, where is my footing? How can I stand in Christ in the face of this verse and get it off me, get the demand off me? You know, yeah, I'm looking for a way to greasily wiggle my way out, you know, definitely. And we should because, like Jesus said, the demand of discipleship is like an army coming at you a king coming at you with a hundred thousand troops and you've got ten thousand troops you need to sit down count the cost and then wave the white flag of surrender that's the only uh, logical answer when you are outnumbered and all the demands in scriptures outnumber you ten to one you don't have a chance so you need to seek terms of pay peace that's what jesus said you seek send an envoy and set, seek the terms of peace so, you know, what is, like, if these accusations come, what if they're true? Then what? You know, see, a lot of people go, well, I hope they're not true. What if they're true? My thing is, like, okay, well, what if they are true? What are you going to do? What is your answer if the accusation fits? Start from there. Just assume it's true and then see what you're going to do. You will come to the conclusion that the only way that you're going to take a breath of air and survive this thing is with the blood of Jesus and with Jesus standing on your side and digging you out of the pit. You do not have hope otherwise. Um, so anyway, uh, as I'm looking at these verses, I will admit that they are very scary. And they're some of the scariest in the Bible. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read them. And then I'm going to back up a little bit and... Uh, show you how I deal with them. Um, so the verse again is 2 Peter uh, 2, chapter 2, 19 through 22. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption, for of a man, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if, here's the scary one, if they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it had been better than them, for it be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But as it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog turned to his own vomit again. And the so and the sow, sorry, that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Um, okay, well, first of all, I used to apply this to myself, and it scared me. And uh, hold on, I'm highlighting something here. Okay, so I would apply this to myself, and it is very scary. Now, notice what we've done. We've taken a couple verses, and we've not regarded the context of the chapter they sit in or the book the chapter is found in which is the first rule so when someone comes at you with an accusation from the scripture 
you should turn around and say, can you tell me what that's about? If they come at you with Second Peter 2, can you turn around and say, hi, do you know what Second Peter is about? Bet you they don't. Hebrews 6, they come at you with Hebrews 6, you know. You can't renew again under repentance. You say, well, what's the book of Hebrews about? And often their only familiarity with the book is the verse that they've chosen to highlight in their fear. And the enemy is behind that, you know, and his tactics are always the same and his verses are always the same. So it's like there's a handful of verses that he always uses. And the last thing he wants you to do is look, read the whole book of Second Peter and make a little outline for yourself and see what it's about, okay? Now, what is the root here is in verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment. What is the way of righteousness and what is the holy commandment? So that's something really important right there, and we'll get to that. But also, when you look at a book like this, one of the best things to do is find out who Peter is talking to and who he's talking about. Who is the author talking to and who is he talking about? And determine from the get-go which group you're in, okay? Now, one of the key words to look for is you, and the other one is them. So when this sounds silly, but it actually gave me a breakthrough because I used to take these books and think that I was the one that he had in view, that he was warning me that I might be one of these people. So what you have to do is say, okay, when does the apostle use the word you? Because when he's using the word you, he's talking about who he's writing to. And whenever he talks about you, he's pretty consistent to dis to address them in a certain tone. He addresses the you in a certain tone. And then if he's warning about a them, T-H-E-M, them, he's talking about those people. He's not talking about you. He's talking about those people. So if you're reading this book with fear and trembling, then that's a good place to be. And you need to realize that as the reader, you are the targeted you that he's writing to. And he has a tone of address. All the apostles, even Jude, a very scary one, has a tone of address when he is talking to you. And you are always the beloved brethren, okay? And he tells you at the beginning of each book, usually, the apostle will tell you why he's writing to you, his beloved brethren, and what characteristics are, are yours. Then, if he decides to talk about a them to give you some kind of warning, he will consistently use the word them, and he won't confuse it with you. You'll confuse it with you, and you'll be reading along, and you'll think, uh-oh, he's talking about me. No, you're not them, you're you. This sounds like a Dr. Seuss book, but this is very simple, and it will clear up a lot of fear, you know? Um Okay, so I want to talk about you in this book, and I want to go back a little bit to the first chapter, and let's just say, who is he writing to, and why is he writing to them? So hold on. Okay, so this book has three chapters, and to summarize, the first chapter is, um, he's writing to them to confirm that the word of the truth that they originally received was not a fable, and that it really was true, and that it is their hope, and it is through this word that they have a, have the power to partake of the divine nature and escape the corruption that's in the world, okay? And everything has to come out of that word, and he keeps using the word remembrance all the way through the first chapter because he's right, he's, he says he's going to put off his tabernacle soon. He's going home to be with the Lord. But he wants to keep putting them in remembrance of what he told them, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ and regarding the prophetic word and that you have a more sure word. I'm bringing, and he keeps saying, I'm stirring you up to remembrance. I want to bring you back to remembrance to this word. It wasn't a fable. It wasn't um, a 
myth. We were eyewitnesses. But even beyond that, you have a more sure word of prophecy, which you do well to heed. Okay. And we'll get into this a little more. But um, then the second chapter is warning about false prophets. So he brings them to remembrance of the word because he's about to tell them, look, false prophets are coming and they were prophesied. This is not a surprise. You should not be surprised. And here's the thing about sheep is we have the Lord's new nature in our heart and we want to love people and we want to give space and we don't want to judge because we don't want to be judged. We want to not take the splinter out of your eye if I've got a beam in mine, right? That's the Lord's teaching. And that's actually corresponds with our new sheep nature. But sheep, as a result, tend to be a little unwise. And so when these false prophets come, we're afraid to call them what they are. And we don't know what to do about it. And now they're starting to do some serious damage because we tend to tolerate them. Because we think, well, I shouldn't judge. So Peter uses very strong language to describe them in 2 Peter so that those he addressed, the you who he had told to remember the word, would be able to contrast what they'd received from the true apostles to the damnable heresies brought in by the false apostles, and so that they would see that these people are really evil. They are not your brother. You can't give them any space. You can't let them be in your feast, and you can't let them just be among you acting without fear you have to deal with this and you have to turn away from them and you have to protect yourself from them and it's okay to set up a boundary and you don't have to listen to these people okay and we'll get into that a little bit too then the third chapter is a reminder that the day of the lord is coming okay now uh the you know these false prophets and everything one of the things about it is that they are the um they are the scoff scoffers you know so he brings it up in that context but also you know whenever the apostles spend a long time talking about you or them in a negative sense so he talks about the false prophets and everything then he turns it back to you so look for that when you're reading the narratives look for when he stopped talking about me and when he started talking about them and then when does he go back to talking about me and you'll see that the tone totally changes again second peter 3 1 the chapter the the last chapter was so severe and we're all scared and shaken in our boots but the first verse of chapter 3 says this second epistle beloved i now write to you in which i stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance there's that word again that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and the commandment of the apostles and the lord our savior knowing this first that there will come in the last days scoffers, okay? So he's saying, look, I'm here to remind you that Jesus and the apostles and the prophets told us about these guys in advance. Don't be surprised. Don't be stumbled. And it kind of reminds me of the parable where the Jesus, uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares. You know, the wheat is sown and then everybody goes to sleep. And while the Lord's servants are sleeping, the enemy sows in tares. Then the servants wake up and go, Lord, there's tares in your field. You know, they're surprised. Should we root them out? And he's like, no, you can't root them out because that'll damage the wheat. So that, what, what is he doing? He's, he, the Lord was already warning that this was going to happen. These tares would come. It would happen while the church kind of goes, like I've always said, as the true sheep of God, we are brought into rest. We go in seasons. Sometimes seasons are very fruitful and active, and then other seasons that don't seem so active outwardly, and they're a time of rest for us where the Lord just leaves us alone. He lets us sleep. Whereas Cain's followers, the children of the serpent, are zealous all the time because they're inflamed by Satan and they never rest. So every time we go to sleep, which is of the Lord, because he's only concerned with our growth and our health. He doesn't even care about the rest, you know. Um, but whenever we go to sleep, the enemy comes and sticks his zealots in all, in all the places, you know. And, I mean, just look at the last 20 years. The church fell asleep in the 80s after or i'm sorry after in the 90s after the revival in the early 90s and then in the mid 90s through the last you know 
uh, 10 years, I guess, there has been a dramatic explosion of heresy where the whole church has just been completely overrun by the emergent and by the NAR and by the, um, you know, the the re reformed and the Cal neo calvinists have resurged and it's really bad out there it's because we went into our slumber and you know what god puts us in slumber because he needs us to be rested for this season we're entering now which is the 11th hour harvest i believe before he comes or maybe it's just his coming it's the 11th hour awakening and it's the 11th hour samaritans going into the field to encourage the saints to stand up and and lift up their heads because their redemption draws nigh you know but he let us sleep and in that slumber the tares were sown same thing here you know and then what happens the sheep wake up and they're confused because now all around them there's all these tares and false prophets and everything and they're like well what do we do that's when the prophetic word comes and reminds you of I'm going to bring you back to remembrance. Remember, this was all spoken of in advance. I don't want you to be stumbled. This has been described clearly by the Lord. He anticipated it. He's got it under control. You need to be at peace in the Lord. That's the admonition. Even Jude, which is so scary about the false prophets and everything, what does it end with? But you, beloved, keeping yourself in the love of God, building on your most holy faith, right? Looking for his appearing, and then he says he can present you without spot, faultless before his own with exultant joy man at the end of that heavy epistle i sure didn't need to hear that right well that's what G, that's what all that all of them do and that's what he's doing here back uh so now let's go back a little bit so that's the general outline of of second peter i'm bringing you to remembrance of the gospel i'm showing you that false prophets have come in and they deny it and then I'm bringing you to remembrance that the Lord warned you that they're that they're going to be there, but that He's coming to judge. Okay, and that judge is for you a good thing. That judgment because He's going to He rescues the godly from the uh, temptation, and even righteous Lot and Noah. Right, He saves you from that hour and puts you, delivers you from it. And he will preserve you. That is supposed to be an encouragement to you that even though this judgment coming, it's not going to fall upon you. Now, so that's the you and the them a little bit. Now I'm just going to read some of these verses to get the tone of the you and the them. First, uh, Second Peter 1, you know, what does he say about you? You to them, or you really, because um, this is who he's writing to. And you're the one he's writing to, even though he uses the word them here. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power has given us, us, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and then it talks about all these things now there's these virtues you know and you add all these things to your faith right and so that you're not unfruitful in the knowledge of the lord and then he says if you lack these things you're blind and has forgotten that you were purged from your old sins so here's where he starts to remind you look brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure i mean in other words assure yourself of your salvation become sure in the faith for if you do these things you will never fall and an entrance will be ministered to you you know this is all good news and now he's saying look i'm gonna die and that's why i'm putting you always in remembrance of these things though you know them that you be established in the present truth it's it's good for me to put stir put you in remembrance he says in verse 13 and again he says in uh, 15 moreover i will endeavor that you after my decease you will always have these things in remembrance what things the faith the knowledge of god the gospel the exceeding great and precious promises are yours to remember and then he reminds them look we saw the glory of jesus christ right but we have this more sure word of prophecy and know this, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy didn't come of old by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So he's saying, look, you have the faith. 
You may have stumbled, but if you have, it's only because you've forgotten you were purged from your sins. Now, why would you be stumbling and lacking everything and forgetting that you're purged of your old sins? And why do you need to be reminded of all this? Because there's false prophets who are speaking a contrary message. And that's what he talks about, 2 Peter 2. There were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Are you the false teachers? No, they are. Who privately will bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. On you? No, on them. Now many shall follow their ways. And by this reason, the truth shall be evil spoken of, okay? And through covetousness. And so they're going to make merchandise of people. And people are going to be vacillate to and fro and follow some of these teachings. Now remember that that is a matter of maturity, not a matter of position in Christ. When you are saved, you've been regenerated and you are secure in the Lord's hand. But you need to grow. And if you look at Ephesians, it talks about how the body is being built up in love, right? So that we would no longer be like babes tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the trickery of men and the deceitfulness of men and the systems of error that they're trying to build with their false doctrine. False doctrine sweeps through the church where there's baby Christians who aren't being nourished with the truth. And that doesn't make them less saved. It makes them less effective. It gets their eyes off the fact of their salvation and they forget about it. And when they've forgotten their salvation and they don't, they're no longer clear about it, now they no longer have the virtues and the life that expresses Christ because they're not abiding in the truth and in the gospel. And so they stay babies and they become more and more miserable and upset and offended. So that's just the way it goes. Corinth was the same way. There's all kinds of winds that went through Corinth. It didn't mean that they weren't saved. Okay. So when he says, look, a lot of people are going to follow their pernicious ways. It's still the false prophets are the one who are going to be judged, not the sheep who tend to follow around until they learn the voice of their shepherd. God has given us a big, even though it's a narrow way to get into the gospel, in a straight way, it's a big pasture where now we're fenced in in the Lord's love, and he's not going to let us go. We are safe in his hand. Now he's now he starts talking really severe, right? He's, he, what do you do? He, he uh, compares them to these angels that sin that go off to strange flesh and they're in chains of darkness and and he spared not the old world now he's talking about judgment right but what does he talk about noah was saved a preacher of righteousness right and then the, he judged sodom and gomorrah and overthrew them talking about them that live ungodly but he delivered just lot now that's a surprise to us because we look at lot as a defeated person who departed from abraham and went after the flesh god abraham said okay you take what you see if you say go to the right i'll go to the left and lot looked up and said oh that's a beautiful land and didn't go to the land of blessing that god had promised as an inheritance but went down to sodom and lived there and he became a leader in sodom where he was actually respected as a member of this terrible community and you know when the angels come to rescue him and the men come he's like here take my daughters rather than take i mean the guy was you know his life was compromised from our point of view and yet what does peter say about him he was just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the world he grieved inwardly even though he was very weak he was righteous because of his covenant relationship and his relationship to Abraham and his faith, you know, he still believed. And now he says, the Lord, like, like Noah and like Lot, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Which are you? You have already been identified as the godly by your faith in Jesus Christ, which he identified in the first chapter. You received that precious faith. We've all received that faith. If you believe, now you say, I've fallen into horrible sin and I've backslidden and I got in the world and everything. Do, am I still? Okay, ask yourself right now, do you believe that God raised Jesus Christ after he died for your sins? You say, I think so. 
No. Do you believe that God had Jesus die for your sins? You'll find that if you're born again, you cannot deny this. No matter what your condition is, you have to go, yeah, I believe that. Well, the reason you believe that is because the Spirit is in you bearing witness that God's record is true, which proves that you've been born of God, regardless of your condition. And see, Peter already warned that these false prophets would come, and because of their false prophecy and false teaching, people would suffer and lose sight of the fact that they were purged of their sins and then would lack every virtue he said were to add to our faith. Brotherly love, kindness, all that stuff would be gone. Well, what's left then? Thorns and thistles. So he, the prophets already told us that the tares would have a damaging effect on the wheat, so to speak, and that the shepherds would abuse the flocks and the sheep would be scattered and would have no food and would be malnourished and would be naked and would be spotted and dirty. The Lord died for you. The Lord died knowing that this was going to happen. And you, if you find yourself in this condition, what you need to do is remember that your sins were purged. That's the first thing is to go back to the gospel and go back to the blood, which is why Peter kept reminding them, you need to go back. That's why I'm stirring you up by way of remembrance. That's why he uses the word remembrance so many times in that first chapter. Okay, so then he's talking about how horrible these people are, but these, not you, these, they're like natural brute beasts. They speak evil of things they do not understand. So these are speaking people. These are teachers. Um, and they will perish in their corruption, and they will receive the word of unrighteousness. Spots they are, blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They have no fear. Absolutely no fear. They're with you. And not only that, but... As you go on a little bit, they have a heart exercised with covetous practices, and they've forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam. And I talked about Balaam in uh, one of the messages on evil seeds, evil trees. Balaam, his whole thing was that he actually secretly hated God's people, but he uh, put on a cloak of righteousness like he was a prophet. And God did speak through him but proved that that wasn't special because he also spoke through a donkey, right? But um, he was known as a prophet, and yet he was taking pay from God's enemies so that he could teach God's enemies how to weaken God's people and bring them into judgment. So these people are not your brother. They are there literally to destroy you, and they uh, are following after this way of Balaam, right? They want to weaken you. They want to bring you into bondage. They count it a pleasure to see God's saints weakened, and yet they pretend to be Christians. These are false believers to the uttermost. We're talking Illuminati, Jesuit, secret society type plants. Whether that, they're that or not, they're just as bad. These people are wells without water. They speak Great swelling words of vanity, alluring through the lust of the flesh, those that are clean to escape from them who live in error, right? They promise liberty. They themselves are servants of corruption. And look at the, you know, the easiest ones to spot, obviously, are the prosperity teachers. I mean, Kenneth Copeland, Ken, you know, Kenneth Hagin, these guys, these were, their doctrine is false and their agenda is false and they hate the people they're ministering to and they are going after Balaam for the wages of unrighteousness. It's all about money for them. Um, and they speak great swelling words of vanity. I've listened to their teachings. It's terrible. And they allure their congregation of baby sheep through the lust of the flesh, right? Promising them everything. And they promise them liberty, but they are servants of corruption. So they are the people that have been overcome. Um, and not only that, but they're, they're bringing people into bondage, okay? Now it says, for F they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, and again entangled in, overcome, the latter end for them is worse than the beginning. This, again, is still talking about the Balaamites. You can say, well, no, it's about the ones that they bring into bondage. No, uh, God, here he said, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. 
Lot looked like he was living in bondage, but he was vexed. And if you're sheep, God's sheep, you may have been damaged by these false prophets to the point where you brought were brought under so much condemnation that you no longer knew which way was up. You forgot you were purged of your sin, and then thorns and thistles came out, no virtue at all. And then you looked at yourself and said, I'm back in the world, I'm completely backslidden, and I'm sinning way more than I thought I ever would because I've got no spiritual power because I've uh, lost touch with the gospel. and But you don't know that you've lost touch with the gospel. So now your mind is in enmity with God, and you're starting to think, why did you do this to me? How could I, I asked for bread and you gave me a stone? You know, you've been damaged. That's how the Lord looks at you. But the question is, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Can you say, yes, I believe that today? Here's the thing. These guys wouldn't say that. In their teaching, they deny the Lord. They deny the Lord that bought them. The Lord bought. He said, well, the Lord bought them. So doesn't that mean they were saved? But then they, no, the Lord bought the whole field to gain the treasure. He bought, he died for our sins, not only ours, but that of the whole world. He purchased the whole field. He's the rightful master and the rightful owner of every man. And we all owe him that acknowledgement, including these false prophets. They deny the Lord that bought them. I think that's in the next chapter. Um, but that means they also deny his work. And that is not just including the false prophets prosperity teachers and stuff but it's also the calvinists and the lordship people that put you under works and turn the grace of god into lasciviousness right now here it says for it been better not to know the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them okay what is the way of righteousness and the holy commandment i'm running out of time but the the way of righteousness is the way of faith through the blood of jesus christ from the very beginning since they're they're um they're likened to balaam here but in jude they're likened to cain from the very beginning there's been a distinction between cain and abel cain offers his works abel offers the blood right the blood is his righteousness and that's why he's accepted cain is rejected and is turns becomes wicked and the sin overpowers him and overcomes him and he kills abel why because he denies the work of the lord this is really critical the way of righteousness is to bring the blood of jesus in to the as your entrance to the holy of holies the blood of the lamb is my way and he's the new and living way where are we going into the father into the holy of holies nowhere else there's not another there's not another destination so if the bible is talking about the way it's talking about the new and living way and if he's talking about righteousness he's only talking about the one to whom the prophets and the law bore witness jesus christ the righteous son of god who loved righteousness and hated iniquity therefore god your god has anointed him with the oil of gladness above your brethren right and uh, what does he say in Romans? He says that um, he is the propitiation that it publicly displayed the righteousness of God. He was born witness to by the law and the prophets, but he is the manifestation of God's righteousness upon those who believe. So the way of righteousness is just the new and living way of Christ himself as our righteousness. This is what they want you to reject. This is what the Lordshippers especially attack, right? And the Holy Commandment is just the gospel. And I don't have time to dig this out, but if you go, you can find this, the commandment. John mentions it too, the new commandment. The commandment is the promise of eternal life. It is not, you know, when Jesus promises you eternal life and you receive it, it's a command as well because he says he has authority to give life to whom he will. And so he commands it to come to you. It's a command. And that's why John says this new commandment is true in him and in you. In other words, and, the, and it produces love, but the life in you is a command from God. That, that's kind of a deeper thing. But it's the testimony of God. It's the command of God. It's the witness of God. And it's in your spirit. The holy commandment is, and, and it comes for the gospel. So the way of righteousness and the holy commandment is the way into the holy of holies through the blood of jesus that is presented in the message of the gospel which becomes a command in those who receive it that's kind of how I'm, this is my inspiration this is how i'm looking at it right now um and i think that's that is right um 
I could say it another way, but that's how I'm saying it right now, in other words. Okay, so then, as it happened unto them, once again, he's not talking to you. Now, he already said that you could very well be in a situation where all you've got is your faith in chapter 1. But you have you need to give diligence and add virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and brotherly and love, right? If these things abound in you, then you won't be barren or unfruitful. So you can be born again, but barren and unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he says the reason is because if you lack these things, you're blind and you've forgotten, right? That he was purged from his old sins. So if you do not have the diligence which added the virtue and the knowledge and the temperance and the patience, in other words, you don't see any fruit in your life and you're barren and you're unfruitful, that is not a sign that you've been rejected from God. That is a sign that probably you've been damaged by the teaching of these false prophets and you need to be brought back to the gospel which they have blinded your eyes so that you're not seeing it it says you're blind and you've forgotten you were purged from your sins so now you need to be established in the present truth and you need to be reminded and stirred up by way of remembrance and that's the apostle's role is to bring you back to tell you the gospel and then to tell you about the false prophets because they're the ones who are doing the damage to you so you need to mark them out and call them out for what they are and not be afraid to say hey that's a false prophet you know like i said the sheep are afraid to judge but we need to make the judgment and see how evil these people are and we know them by what they profess and what they deny they deny the lord that bought him they deny the lord's work that's the thing um okay i'm going to stop now take this as just kind of like a introduction to the book and read it again and see if it still strikes the same kind of fear in you i sure hope this helped um amen talk to you later